Skies of denial. The camera opens on a single room, a modest, dimly lit space cluttered with papers, monitors, and the faint hum of machinery. The walls are covered with star charts, and the only source of light is a large screen displaying a glowing trajectory map of Earth and a massive asteroid. Dr. Eleanor Grant, an astrophysicist in her late 40s, sits at a desk, her face illuminated by the screen. Her voice, calm but strained, begins the narration. They called it Hyperion, a celestial wanderer, millions of years in the making, and in less than six months, it will be here. Right now, it's just a blip, a speck of light drifting across the void. But that speck is moving at 50,000 miles per hour, straight toward Earth. She pauses, staring at the blinking red dot on the map. Her hands tighten into fists. I first spotted it two months ago. I triple-checked my calculations, ran simulations, and sent urgent messages to everyone I could think of. Government agencies, space programs, even private aerospace companies. And what did I get in return? She leans back in her chair, letting out a bitter laugh. Eleanor. Silence, or worse, skepticism. A notification pops up on her screen. Press conference. Hyperion update. Eleanor reluctantly clicks it, and the audio fills the room. Earlier today, global leaders addressed growing concerns about the so-called Hyperion asteroid, Officials insist there is no immediate threat, dismissing claims of impending impact as premature speculation. Here's what President Coleman had to say. The screen shows a polished government official at a podium, speaking confidently. Our top scientists have assured us that Hyperion poses no danger to Earth. Let's not fall prey to alarmism or fear-mongering. The world has more pressing issues to focus on. Eleanor closes the stream in frustration, slamming her hands on the desk. No danger? How can they say that? The math doesn't lie. It never lies. Hyperion will hit. A direct impact. Total extinction. And yet, they choose to deny it, because facing the truth is harder than living a lie. She picks up a stack of printed reports, flipping through them rapidly. The camera zooms in on highlighted phrases. Projected impact zone, North Atlantic. Global catastrophic event, 99.7% certainty. Eleanor sighs, her tone softening. I get it. Nobody wants to believe the end is coming. It's easier to call me a pessimist, a doomsayer, a crackpot. But the universe doesn't care about politics or opinions. The universe only cares about physics. She swivels her chair toward another screen displaying live footage of Hyperion, now slightly larger, a faint gray rock against the black backdrop of space. I've spent my entire career studying the stars, marveling at their beauty, their power. But now that beauty has turned deadly. Hyperion isn't just a rock. It's a mirror showing humanity who we really are, fragile, divided, unprepared. She types furiously on the keyboard, composing another email. The camera zooms in on her words. Two, Global Crisis Coalition. Subject, Urgent Hyperion Mitigation Plan. Dear colleagues, this is my fifth attempt to reach you. Time is running out. We need immediate international collaboration to deflect or destroy Hyperion. I've attached updated projections. Please, we must act now. Sincerely, Dr. Eleanor Grant. She hesitates before hitting send, then leans back in exhaustion. I've sent over a hundred emails like this, and every time I get the same response. Thank you for your concern, but the matter is under review. Under review, as if the asteroid cares about bureaucracy. Her phone buzzes. She glances at the screen. Mom, call me back. Eleanor sighs, but doesn't pick up. My daughter, Rachel, keeps asking why I'm not visiting her anymore. How do I tell her the truth? That I'm spending every waking moment trying to stop the end of the world? That I might fail? She rubs her temples, the weight of the situation visible on her face. I've done everything I can think of emails, calls, even leaked my findings to the press. But people don't want to listen. They're too busy arguing about who's to blame, whether it's real or if it's all just a hoax. Meanwhile, Hyperion keeps coming, unstoppable, uncaring. The room falls silent, save for the rhythmic beeping of her monitors. Eleanor stares at the screen, the asteroid's trajectory now flashing ominously closer. Sometimes I wonder if they'll believe me when the sky finally burns, when the shockwave flattens cities and the oceans boil, 
but by then, it won't matter. The time to act will be long gone. A knock on the door startles her. She doesn't answer. The knocking grows louder. Eleanor, open up! She hesitates, then reluctantly stands and opens the door. A young man in a suit, an official of some kind, steps in, carrying a briefcase. Official. Dr. Grant, we need to talk. The government has finally reviewed your findings. Eleanor narrows her eyes, crossing her arms. And? The official avoids her gaze, setting the briefcase on the desk. He opens it to reveal a stack of documents stamped with the words classified. Official, they've decided to prepare evacuation protocols, just in case. Eleanor's expression hardens. Evacuation? To where? Do you have a fleet of starships hidden somewhere? The official shifts uncomfortably. It's more of a contingency plan for those who can afford it. Eleanor slams her fist on the desk. You're telling me billions of people are going to die and your solution is to save the wealthy? The official stammers, but Eleanor cuts him off. No, that's not good enough. We can stop Hyperion if we act now, if we launch every resource we have. Why won't they listen? The official sighs, closing the briefcase. Because listening means admitting they're powerless, and no one wants to admit that. He turns to leave, but Eleanor grabs his arm. Tell them this. When Hyperion hits, they won't be remembered as leaders. They'll be remembered as cowards. The door closes behind him, leaving Eleanor alone again. She collapses back into her chair, staring at the blinking red dot on the screen. The skies are quiet now, calm, deceptive, but soon they'll light up with fire and fury. And when they do, humanity will finally see the truth. We were given a warning, and we chose denial. The dim room is unchanged, the soft hum of machinery filling the silence. Eleanor sits motionless, her gaze locked on the trajectory screen. Her fingers hover over the keyboard, trembling slightly, before she types a new message. I've been told to give up, that it's out of my hands now. But I can't. Not when I know there's still a chance, no matter how small. If no one else will act, then I'll have to find another way. She sends the email to all private aerospace innovators, subject, Hyperion Emergency Proposal. Dear sirs and madams, time is against us, but solutions are not out of reach. If governments won't take action, I urge the private sector to lead. I'm willing to collaborate on a deflection plan immediately. The future of humanity depends on us, Dr. Eleanor Grant. Her hand lingers on the mouse as she presses send, the weight of the moment sinking in. Desperation isn't an option anymore. It's the only strategy we have. A loud ping draws her attention. One of her monitors shows a reply. She opens it eagerly. Dr. Grant, we've reviewed your proposal and are interested in a joint initiative. However, we require more detailed projections before committing resources. Time is short, so let's act fast. Artemis Space Tech. A spark of hope flickers in her eyes. Artemis, of course, they've been pushing boundaries for years terraforming, asteroid mining. If anyone can help, it's them. She begins typing rapidly, sending files, calculations, and simulations. The screen fills with equations, impact models, and blueprints for a hastily conceived deflection mission. We'll need every resource, gravitational tugs, kinetic impactors, maybe even nuclear options. It's dangerous, untested, but the alternative is unthinkable. Her phone rings, startling her. She glances at the screen. Rachel. After a long pause, she answers. Rachel. Mom, are you okay? You haven't called me back. Eleanor hesitates, her voice heavy with exhaustion. I'm fine, Rachel. Just busy. Busy. Busy with what? You sound tired. Is this about that asteroid thing you were talking about? Eleanor swallows hard, choosing her words carefully. Yes. It's serious, Rachel. More serious than I wanted to admit to you. A pause on the other end of the line. So, what happens? Are we safe? Eleanor's voice cracks slightly. I don't know yet, but I'm doing everything I can to make sure we are. I promise. Promise me you'll come see me soon. Eleanor closes her eyes, tears welling up. I will. I love you, Rachel. The call ends, and Eleanor sits in silence for a moment. Her resolve hardens. I'm not just fighting for humanity. I'm fighting for her, for everyone who deserves a future. A notification pings. 
Artemis Space Tech has sent a detailed response. Mission approved. Prototype kinetic impactor ready in four weeks. Coordination with other agencies recommended. Awaiting confirmation to proceed. Eleanor's hands shake as she types her reply. Proceed immediately. She hits send and exhales deeply, her shoulders finally relaxing for the first time in weeks. For the first time, I feel like we have a chance. It's slim, barely a thread, but it's enough. It has to be. The camera lingers on her face, determination etched into her features. The screen behind her continues to display the asteroid's trajectory, the red dot moving closer. The room is still, but now it feels less like a tomb and more like a command center, a place where humanity's fate might just be rewritten. Eleanor enters a sleek, high-tech conference room. The walls are adorned with digital screens, and around the large oval table sit high-ranking officials, politicians, military leaders, and top executives from global aerospace companies. The air is thick with tension. Eleanor's heart pounds as she takes a seat, glancing at the stern faces around her. The room falls silent as President Coleman enters, flanked by advisors. He gives Eleanor a curt nod before sitting down at the head of the table. Dr. Grant, we've reviewed your proposal. You've got our attention, but we're going to need some assurances. The world is watching, and a mistake at this stage could lead to panic. Eleanor straightens, trying to control her nerves. She places a thick stack of reports on the table, each one detailing the deflection strategy, the calculations, and the potential risks. Every calculation is sound. We have four weeks, just enough time to launch a deflection mission, but only if we pool our resources and work together. The asteroid's trajectory is confirmed. It will hit in precisely 29 days. If we act now, we can change the course. There's a murmur among the officials. One of the military generals speaks up. General Wilson, and what about the fallout if the mission fails? We launch everything we have and it doesn't work? Uh, what's our contingency? Eleanor's face tightens, but she doesn't flinch. Eleanor. We won't fail. The plan is foolproof. A government official, who has been silent until now, leans forward. Official. Dr. Grant, with all due respect, you're not seeing the bigger picture. Even if we manage to deflect Hyperion, there's another issue we have to deal with. The global economy is teetering on the brink. We're not prepared to risk everything on a mission that's not guaranteed to succeed. Eleanor stares at him, baffled. Eleanor, are you telling me you'd rather do nothing? Let Earth be wiped out because of an economic issue? Official, it's not just about money. It's about control. Resources are already scarce. Nations are on the brink of war. Mobilizing for this mission will destabilize the entire global system. It might be better to let nature take its course and prepare for the aftermath. Eleanor's heart sinks. She can't believe what she's hearing. These people are willing to let an extinction event unfold because they're afraid of the short-term chaos? We need a backup plan, Dr. Grant. A fail-safe. The mission is too costly to fail. Eleanor's voice rises, the frustration palpable. I'm telling you, there, there's no backup. We either deflect it now or we face extinction. And yet you're talking about risk and costs, like they matter more than the future of every living thing on this planet. A long pause follows as the officials exchange uneasy glances. Finally, the president speaks again, his voice cold and decisive. After careful consideration, we've decided that we will not proceed with your plan. Eleanor's eyes widen in shock. What? You can't be serious. The asteroid is a certainty. We've made our decision. We will focus on preparing for the impact. Evacuation plans are already in place for select regions. It's time for humanity to face the consequences of its actions. Eleanor feels the blood drain from her face as the weight of his words crashes down on her. She stands abruptly, pushing her chair back. You can't be this blind. We have a chance to stop it, and you're throwing it away. As she storms toward the door, the room behind her erupts in tense murmurs. She pauses, her hand on the door handle, her voice trembling with a mix of anger and disbelief. Eleanor, you'll be remembered for this. You'll go down in history, not as leaders, but as the people who let the world die, because you were too afraid to act. She slams the door behind her, the sound echoing in the silent hallway. 
Cut to. The scene is now outside, with Eleanor pacing through the sterile government building, a growing sense of dread gnawing at her. She glances at her phone. There's a new notification. Update. Hyperion's trajectory has shifted slightly. Impact now predicted in 27 days. Her blood runs cold. The time is slipping away faster than she imagined. But then, another message follows. This one from Artemis Space Tech. She opens it with trembling fingers. We have analyzed new data. Unfortunately, we can no longer support the mission. We've withdrawn our resources. Good luck. Eleanor's mind races. Every hope, every shred of optimism she had built up over the past few days is evaporating. She stumbles out of the building, her body shaking as the full scope of what's happening dawns on her. Cut to. The camera pans across the sky above Earth, a deep, eerie silence hanging in the air. The asteroid, now a visible, looming figure against the stars, grows ever closer. In the distance, the last of the futile attempts to prepare for impact continue, but the real battle is lost. The light of the world's greatest minds fades as they choose to hide in their castles of comfort, unwilling to face the unchangeable truth. Eleanor stands alone on a rooftop, looking up at the sky, tears streaming down her face. Eleanor, I warned them. I gave them every chance to make the right choice. But they chose to bury their heads in the sand. And now, we'll all pay the price. As the camera pulls away, the asteroid's shadow begins to blot out the stars, and Earth braces for its final moment, unavoidable, unstoppable, and doomed by the very choices humanity refused to make fade to black. The truth can't be ignored forever, but when it is, the consequences are inevitable. 